So I got to tell everybody, I got this beautifully wrapped package in the mail, very long, very flat, very cardboard. And I knew instinctively that it was original art because it was coming from yeah. Brad Geiger. And it's yeah. just wrapped that distinctive way that you wrap original art. I open it up. And inside <laughs> is one of the uh, I, a, a original art that I've never seen before in my life. It's a Mutton Jeff, which is this super classic American comic strip from the first half of the century. And I am blown away. It's gorgeous. But I've got to ask you, Brad, because the most bonkers thing happened, or well, not happened, this original art has the, the paste ups of every character's head has a new yeah. head pasted on it. And I didn't, I don't, I who like to think that I know what's going on in, in comic strip history, I don't know what's, I'm not actually that familiar with Mutt and Jeff. Why would the, this cartoonist have pasted over the heads of every characters and changed every character? I wanted, I, I so, so I got, I, uh, full, full disclosure, this is your official 50th birthday present. Oh, I, that's I've nice. Been, I've been working on this for a, for a while now, and I wanted to send you something, you know, I, I, to, so you didn't think I forgot the day, but this is what I've been working on. So what, first things first, Mutton Jeff was uh, officially the first ever daily newspaper comic strip. Oh, All really? Right? So, Even before like the Cats and Jammer kids? and cat, Before Cats and Jammers, Mutt's, Mutt and Jeff, as far as my research goes, and, okay. and, and you know, a, a historian, if I'm wrong, a historian can, uh, can correct me and, and I'll do a retract, but uh, back when I was writing the Everything Cartooning book, I remember researching this. Right, right. And Mutt and Jeff was the first. So uh, I, I wanted you to have a Mutt and Jeff comic for your original art collection. Yeah, because I don't I. By the way, not only do I not have one, Brad, I don't know that I've ever even seen a physical Mutt and Jeff, not even in like Ohio State's archives. Or I'm sure they have them, but I they yeah. didn't have them on display when I was there. They didn't have them at the Schultz Museum. They didn't have them at uh, at Angoulême or at the Smithsonian out on display. I have never physically seen a Mutt and Jeff comic strip. Yeah, and, and and it is it's such a great. I mean, it's got that classic tall guy and squat guy, yeah. right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It was it, it, it's it, it, that we've seen even in like Calvin and Hobbes, uh, you know, and 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 beyond. I mean, it it was one of the really earlier early uh, uh, uses of that trope. Uh, but here's the thing: Bud Fisher is the creator of Mutton Chef. And he got tired with the comics sometime around 1930. Like, he, it was wildly successful. And, of course, newspapers were the dominant medium at this point. Uh, radio is just starting to compete. TV is in the offing. So, you know, these guys, these syndicated cartoonists in the first half of the century are pulling down bank. Oh, yeah, and yeah. Bud Fisher cannot be bothered anymore doing the Mutt and Jeff comic strip. So he brings in a cartoonist <laughs> by the name of Al Smith. And right. Al starts taking on a greater and greater role in, in the comic, right? Okay. Over the years, he does more and more and more until finally he's just doing the comic. It's, 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 he's writing it and, and, and uh, inking it, uh, penciling it. He's doing everything, right? It, it, including signing the the strip, it, it becomes Mutt and Jeff by Al Smith. Oh, does it? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. For a while, he's 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 putting his actual signature on things. All well and good. In fact, what you've got there is a Mutt and Jeff strip, but you've also got something else okay. because later on, Al Smith is, is, uh, uh, decides he wants his own comic strip as well. And he starts his own comic called Rural Delivery. Okay. I'm sorry, rural. That's like that joke in 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 uh, uh, Thirty Rock. Rural juror. He called yeah, it yeah. rural delivery. What a terrible rural title. Rural delivery. Okay. Yeah, you got to be careful by pronouncing that one. But yeah, that's what he called it. And it had a tall character and a squat character. And what Al Smith evidently did, and you've got proof of this now, is he took a bunch of Mutt and Jeff strips, he kept the same strip, pasted his character's heads oh. over top of Mutt and Jeff, oh. and re-released them as rural delivery. Oh, okay, first of all, holy hell, I did not know that. I, I who like to think that I know a lot of comics history, I did not know that. Also, the brass set on him to yes. do that. I mean, yes. I guess 
in a world where syndication kind of didn't exist or at least there might not be book collections of older stuff like right. if you do it with i guess what a 20 year gap between the first appearance and the second appearance yeah that's that's significant enough where probably no one would remember you know aside from Holy heck, Brad! He yeah. used his own stuff twice and pasted over new characters. Yes, and 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 it's, to a certain extent, I mean, yes, it's it's a bit of a cheat. But also, I could see Al Smith saying, "Hey, I I I did this. It's mine." Or, or you know, like, like over certain parts, maybe he only did the lettering on one and did the inking, or maybe there's some that he did all of it. But he's like, "This is mine. I'm gonna reuse it. I should get credit for this as yeah. Al Smith, the cartoon." Doing not working under Bud Fisher for Mutt and Jeff. This is mine. <laughs> and he, re- who's going to catch him? Who's going? Who's paying attention to, and memorizing Mutt and Jeff strips? Oh I mean, God! I, I would imagine there's some people somebody who knew, knew it. it. Yeah, but right. Mm, yeah, but also at the level of intercommunication, like somebody in Toledo, Ohio, who has clipped out every but Mutt and Jeff, right, and kept right. it. Uh, how would he let the world know? There was no, there was no social exactly. type media back then. So maybe he'd write a letter to the editor or something, right. and they certainly wouldn't publish it because it's going to look bad on it them. It embarrasses them, yeah. Uh, and I'm sure it, I'm sure it happens. I'm sure it happens even in today's uh, uh, comics. Oh, sure, oh, I know uh, it does. You know where they either rewrite an old strip or just straight up reuse an old strip because. Yep. Again, who's paying attention? Yeah. <laughs> right. So uh, it, it's it, but but uh, the fact that you've got that it, it, not only the comic, but the you could tell, you know, the glue has aged the, the paper oh, in yeah, a certain way. See, yeah. Uh, and, and you've got the cutouts. They included the cutouts with it. I don't know how the hell you mat and frame something like that if you do. But. I, it, it, it was just too good to pass up. It was too good to pass up when I saw it coming across eBay. Uh, no, we don't need to go into it far, but I was trying to think about how I'm going to mat this because I want as a bit yeah. of cartoon history to yes. say this is a Mutt and Jeff, but it's also this other, whatever that other one was from the 50s. Rural uh, Delivery. Rural, oh God, Rural Delivery. Rural, rural Delivery. Piece of shit title. Um, but I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm going to a box frame it or something. I don't know. How, I don't know how I'm going to do it. But dude, this yeah. is the coolest gift ever because A, how fun to have a Mutt and Jeff. I don't know how to have a and Jeff, but also B, how fun to see the human side of the, I'm just going to reuse it. No one will know. Yeah. I'm going to get done with this. Get back out to the golf course. Oh, yeah. Who cares? I mean, I'm going to cash we, my checks. We don't need to go too far into it, but um, but Bud Fisher, who did... Um, who did uh, Mutt and Jeff for decades before he passed it on. He was super wealthy from Mutt and Jeff. Yeah. I yes. mean, he he owned and uh, raced racehorses, that, one of which won like the Belmont Stakes and stuff. He, I mean, as you were saying before, this is before TV. This yeah. is before, uh, you know, uh, the only other big ways to make it were like local vaudeville or local Broadway as far as a big time entertainer yeah. uh, or musicians. And these were the first sort of national artists uh, much like musicians that that everyone knew, everyone followed. It was big money to be made. Yeah, and meanwhile, Al Smith, a name that no one knows, may be one of the longest running cartoonists in American comics history because his career went more than 50 years. If you remember, Charles Schultz topped out just under 50 years. Smith's career goes between uh, Mutt and Jeff and, and uh, Rural Delivery. This guy's going for more than 50 years, maybe one of the longest continually running cartoonists who you've never heard of, and yet here he is. <laughs> oh my God! Here he is doing doing this stuff that you've you, you've you've never paid attention. It's the first time most of our listeners have never heard the the, the name Rural Delivery. They never <laughs> heard the artist Al Smith. You know, yeah. and yet what a great story from comics history. And this gift is amazing, Brad. I, I could not thank you enough as a birthday gift. It was so fun to see a Mutt and Jeff and yeah. also fun to see the paste ups. And on a, on a note of huge friendship, I'm going to say hello, everybody, and welcome to Comic Lab, the show about making comics. And making a living from comics. I'm Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. And I'm his friend with a champagne problem because now I have to figure out how to how to frame a, a, a double sort of uh, Mutt and Jeff. It's going to be fun to try to do. Uh, I'm the cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of the documentary Stripped. And this week's Hour of Comics Advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, Dave! 
Let's talk comics. Let's talk comics, my friend. And before we get into it, I just want to remind everybody, I think if I have my scheduling right, this is the final days of my Kickstarter over at picklesbook.com. And if you haven't jumped in, man, I would love for you to join us. Uh, the book is going to be huge, 240 pages, all color, all yeah. Sheldon comics that have never uh, been in print before. And I'm looking through the InDesign file, and it's literally some of my favorite comics I've ever done. I think you're yeah. really going to love it. I have no idea where the state of the Kickstarter is right now. If I'm failing, if I'm succeeding. <laughs> Seating, go have a look at picklesbook.com and jump in. I'm really proud of this book. Yeah, absolutely. And just a note, coming up uh, soon in uh, Pro Tips, we're going to do a multi-part series on Kickstarter. We're, yes. we're just going to do a deep, deep dive. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about it on the show, I'm sure. But I, I am literally champing at the bit to do a fast forward to when you're done with the Kickstarter. Because just looking at my Kickstarter numbers and and my outreach, there are some jaw dropping uh, 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 conclusions I'm reaching. Just looking at where my Kickstarter is right now, uh, jaw dropping. Uh, like 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 with permutations that go way beyond Kickstarter itself. Uh, as to what's going on in web-based publishing today. Yes. I cannot wait to get into it with you. Uh, guaranteed, either on Pro Tips, where which goes out to our Patreon backers, or on the show, one of those places, we're going to start getting down into numbers. We're going to start drilling down. And I think, I, I just here's a little something. If this conversation goes the way we think it's going to go, I'm going to make an announcement for a project I've got planned for the fall that will absolutely be amazing if if it happens the way I think it's going to happen. In other words, if we have the conversation, I think it's going to go the way I'm going to go. I'm going to set out to prove something with a Kickstarter. And if I do, it's I, I will do the rest it's going to mean I stopped doing a lot of stuff that I've been doing for 15 years. Oh, wow. Wow. I have no I think I know what you Are mean. You but I, don't have a, I don't have a fully clarified. Anyway, regardless, I'm excited to do this super, super deep dive. We're going to do a multi part yes. Kickstarter deep dive on pro tips. And the way you get pro tips is over at patreon.com slash comic lab. You join us. You get access to 300 uh, pro tips episodes. Those are deep dives and our writer's room where we develop ideas in real time without a net. Uh, and so we strongly recommend you join us over at patreon.com slash comic lab. And then, Brad, I'm going to jump us into our first question today. Yeah. This comes in uh, and says, uh, hey, Brad and Dave. First, I wanted to say I love the show and I'm glad I finally joined into the Patreon. I especially like being part of the community on the Discord. Hey, that's appropriate hey, to for wonderful. right after what I was just talking about. We all have peaks and valleys in our journey as creators. And I personally am just coming out of a long valley. I'm on an upward projector a trajectory. I feel more creative and productive than I have in a long time. So here's my question. Do you guys have any tips on maximizing the time spent in a creative peak period? What are yeah. some things I can do to keep that creative spark going before I inevitably reach another creative valley thank you for all the advice and laughs you guys continue to bring on the show i look forward to it every week all the best nathan k, k. mcwilliams that's uh, coming in from nathan thank you so much for the kind words yeah. i'm so sorry and i'm realizing there's a post-it note call me nate if it's easier <laughs> <laughs> well there we go dave kellett reading ahead famous for yes. reading ahead there we yes. go um anyway nate thank you for that great question brad what do you think in terms of uh first of all nate i'm happy that you're coming out of a creative slough um, yeah. but Brad, that's an interesting word, maximizing, uh, creativity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. how do you maximize your creative peaks, Brad? This is such a great question. Not too, and, and in fact, it, it, it's coming back to something that uh, not too long ago, we had a show where somebody was asking how to, ma how, how, how to best rest. What's the best way to rest? Right. Right. They uh, remember that show where he said, I, 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 I want to maximize my rest. Yes. And I believe that's where we learned that Brad J Bradley J Geiger, big fan <laughs> of stretching, big, yes. very pro stretching. Although I do have to say somebody <laughs> came into the discord. I will say this, uh, just to wrap this topic up, somebody, uh, Eric Campling came into the discord okay. and did exactly what I needed. And I'm past it. Now he explained to me for the first time ever, why you need to stretch uh, and what's happening during this. You're actually retraining your nerve endings. You're, you're, you're telling nerve endings that certain things can happen a certain, yeah, I got to go back to the discord. I wasn't planning on talking about this specifically, but 
I'm pa- I, like it removed my mental block because he explained it. He, it. Now it makes sense. I can do it now. Look at I'm stretching right now, Dave. I feel healthier already. <laughs> He is actually stretching. <laughs> I will say too, that's actually one of the benefits of of, of pro tips as a shared yeah. uh, Discord server for Patreon members is that it's a it's a gathering of pros and pro ams and amateurs. And honestly, yeah. it's always best idea wins in there in terms of like. Yeah. Uh, and so thank you, Eric, for for teaching yeah. my friend that stretching yeah. is worthwhile. I just I just needed somebody oh to explain God. it. That's all I oh needed. That's all I, I would it. say. But but we're not going to go down and like, remember, yes. Dave. Useful. Actionable, yeah, useful, actionable, practical useful, advice. Useful, actionable, practical advice. All so right. here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. It's, I, and I didn't get a chance. We got so distracted with my stretching. I didn't get a chance to say this, and I wanted to. And that is this. We're kind of living in a late capitalist nightmare. We all know this. People have said it. It's, there, it's plenty of social media memes. But we do have to acknowledge that as self-publishers particularly, trying to survive in late capitalism There's a lot going on and you are perfectly forgiven for saying things and thinking things like, how do I maximize my rest? Right. Right. With the idea of I've only got five minutes to rest, but I need to get 30 minutes of restfulness out of it. How do I do that? (laughs) The answer is you don't. You don't maximize rest. (laughs) All you can do is take a break. You can't, I don't know that you maximize because as soon as you start trying to maximize rest, you're not resting anymore. Yeah, <laughs> you're yeah. working, right? Yeah. I, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to get the, 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 the top apex rest. Well, you, you can't. And to this, and so there, there's a real problem with us trying to, I mean, listen, I, I multitask with the best of them. I, I, I try to maximize certain parts of my day because I need to get the most out of it. I understand this rise and grind hustle culture thing that we're all kind of thrust into. But at the same time, I don't know that you can maximize rest and I don't know that you can maximize creativity. I don't know that you can maximize uh, a peak creative moment (laughs) <laughs> because this, in the same way that restfulness is like that, the moment you start focusing on maximizing it, you stop being creative. Yeah, it's true. It's a little bit like, Brad, have you, I don't know if it's come across your transom, but there's a, a billionaire or a hundred millionaire who's trying to um, lengthen his lifespan and he's doing all sorts of like experimental stuff in terms of stem cells yeah. and blood transfers and, and you know, eating this weird diet and it a little bit feels like trying to calm your anxiety by overly tracking your anxiety. Like yeah, I'm going to oh, fix exactly. my OCD by tracking my OCD. You know what I mean? Yes. And so this guy's doing all this stuff and I'm like, well, you're not really living in the meantime. You're he's taking exactly. like 48 supplements a day. He's like, okay, great. You're going to get an extra year out of this, but it won't be much of a life in terms of, <laughs> but in the mean, yeah, yeah. But, but in the meantime, after you take all those pills, you're going to live longer, but you're going to rattle the whole time. <laughs> or you're going to be on the John for 48 hours of your yeah, day. You know? Uh, so it, in part, what I what I take from what Brad's saying, and I, by the way, I agree with it and I co-sign it, is that I often find that I notice my creative peaks, Brad, not when mm. I'm in it, but when I'm yes. six months or six years past <laughs> it and I'm reading yeah. back over my archives and I'm like, wow, I was really in a stride at that point. I don't know what was yes. going on in my life. I don't know what I was doing, but this, this hits, this hits, this hits. God, every punchline was working. Every, every uh, plot twist was working. Uh, and I, I say that as someone who's been cartooning for 25 years I do occasionally notice it when I'm in it, but more often than not, I notice it when I'm past it. Well, I've said this so many times. I won't know whether I'm a really good writer until five years from now, because it's going to take a certain amount of time to really forget everything that I wrote. Right. Or in the mindset that I was in and all that other stuff and really read my own stuff with a with a with an open slate. Right. To, to judge whether it was actually funny, whether it was actually compelling plots and stuff like that. It, it's going to take several years to know whether I am really good. And, and, and that's the same thing that that we're facing here is that it, it, you might be mistaking. I, let me ask you this. I, I wasn't planning on going here, but it, it just popped into my head. You can tell it, Give me a gut check here and tell me whether I'm. Um, sniff enough uh, towards towards the right trail here. You might be conflating, you might be confusing being in a creative peak with being happy 
or or well centered or well you know your mind is in a good place and you might be conflating a, a low creative period with being uh, the opposite being maybe depressed or unhappy or any number of other things mentally you might be conflating creativity with happiness i'm happy when i'm creative right uh but <laughs> it, it the opposite is it can also be true some people are very very uh productive when they're in a in a downward spiral so what i'm i guess what i'm trying to say is uh i i wouldn't make assumptions about your creativity until you give yourself the the time and the perspective to look back like dave just got done saying and really judge yourself. And in the meantime, how can you deal with these peaks and valleys, whether it's your, whether you're charting creativity or, or happiness or mindfulness or anything else? How do you do that? Well, I think the answer here is to be kind to yourself when you do find yourself in a valley, no matter what kind of valley it is, and just try to appreciate when you're not in that valley. It, and who cares if maybe you're on the way up, maybe you're at the peak, maybe you're 10 feet from the peak, maybe you're on the way down. Who cares? Just appreciate the fact that you're clearly not in a valley. I mean, does, what if... I, Am I am I getting close to being near something there? I, I honestly don't know. It just popped into my head. No, you're absolutely on the right path. And I agree with you. I will say this, that I think I, I will give you an actual strategy to sort of maximize creativity, both in good times and in bad, which is establish patterns and schedules in your life because the regularity make sure that this one might be bad, but you're back at the table tomorrow, you know, and you're you're yeah. back at it. Um if you let whims carry you solely and you have a bad uh, comic page or bad output on Monday, sometimes yeah. the sadness of it not turning out the way you want it would make you go, I'm going to wait until I feel that spark again. And I've had yeah. some friends where that's it takes months for that spark to come back. But if yeah. you keep yourself on a schedule, you'll work through those two or three bad comics. And then on Thursday, bang, one of the best comics you've ever done. You yes. didn't know it was there. It, suddenly it comes, it arrives. And it's the schedulness, the regularity of it that, mm -hmm. uh, that I'm getting at that sometimes has helped me in working through moderately okay comics to get to the great one on Thursday that I didn't know I had in me, you know, it, and it ended yeah. up being one of the best ones I ever had. Like Brad, yes. I will say I've had stages in my life where I was truly sad and somehow I made the best comics that I've ever made. Some, and then yeah. there's other times in my life where I have been genuinely overjoyed, the best moments of my life. I've also created some of the, like you never know what the conditions are um, that are gonna generate true sparking creativity. It's the regularity of it that makes mm -hmm. you go from amateur to pro because you have the tools ready and the and the vision ready to catch the idea when it happens to you. Um, and yeah. also the things that that the regularity itself spurs you to write and the continuation of writing generates tomorrow's idea and the day after that's idea. Um, yeah. But I will say this, I wanted, I wanted, this is a side note thing, but I want to talk about happiness and creativity because I have a lot of artist friends and then I always read, it always seems to be French painters. They always talk about like, <laughs> well, you can't create art unless you're in pain. Art yes. only comes from pain. Art only comes mm. from pain. Similarly, I have friends who were afraid to go on like uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors or, or anti-depression drugs because they were afraid they were going to lose their creativity if they right. weren't depressed or if they weren't sad, both of which is bullshit. It doesn't change you at all. It just, it just makes your life quality better, for God's sakes. For, so first of all, take care of your mental health. But secondly, like uh, creativity works in, in upsides and in downsides um, in the same way that much like a relationship, you, you love someone in the good days and the bad days. And um, so... I don't I don't subscribe to this idea that comedy can only come from a pained life. I live a very mm. happy life and I like to think I write some pretty funny stuff. So um, uh, and also there are days where I'm incredibly sad and write some really funny stuff. It can come from both is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I overall overall, I think I, I think our best advice that we can give is to appreciate the the good times, whether it's a, a creative upswing or whether it's just you're in a good place mentally appreciate the good times be nice to yourself during the bad yes. times <laughs> yes yes you know realize that we all have creative peaks and valleys and it happens uh even though i i think i would argue you don't actually know until you've got a lot more perspective like six months to a year that you're actually looking at this but but it, 
I, I, but I really do. I, I really do feel strongly that if you're in the middle of a creative high point, whether whether you realize it or not, I think one of the best ways to kill it is to start thinking about maximizing it. Right. Because when you're creative, everything's popping, everything's happening. You're you, and, and it's 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 almost like a frantic. Your, your brain is making connections where no connections were there before. And if you stop doing that, if you stop the something out of nothing power of your brain and you start trying to add ones and zeros and maximizing. And if I take five minutes here and if I get a day that that's. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're going to kill it. I think you're going to kill creativity right, by right. trying to maximize right. it. I will say this too. And then, and this might be my answer. My final answer is that it's not happiness. It's not sadness. What it is, is new stimuli in your life. Very often are mm -hmm. a contributor towards creativity. Like when I get off this ostensibly phone call with Brad, this hour podcast, right. I am quantifiably funnier at the end of this call and, and quicker and more on my toes than I was when I first started talking to Brad because he's given yeah. me an hour of stimulation with one of the funniest people I know, right? And also interesting thoughts. The same is true with travel. It's with reading new books. It's with talking to new people. I find that I'm least creative when I'm by myself doing the same things for too long because yeah. then it's a cyclical pattern of I had oatmeal for breakfast. I walk the dog. <sighs> I did that. You know what I mean? Like I'm not, I'm yeah. not trying anything new. I'm not giving any new fodder for my creativity. So perhaps that is one thing to help encourage your creativity. Yes, health. Yes, exercise. Yes, good mm -hmm. food, good fuel for your body, but also stimuli, new, st new people, talking to people, socializing, going places, seeing things, reading things. I have often yeah. found that that has, uh, has been a positive contributor to my creativity. Absolutely. I've, it's the same reason, I, honest to goodness, that I teach uh, uh, my classes on Monday because I, I get up there and I talk about all these topics, creativity and writing. And, and, and I'm talking to young people who are very often uh, kind of excited about this topic. You know, sometimes sometimes they're not too excited. Sometimes they fall asleep <laughs> while I'm talking. Uh, but 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 a lot of times that uh, not only are they interested but they have questions. They have they, they challenge what I say sometimes, and I've got to be on my toes enough to and and know my subject well enough that I can face that challenge and I can come up with a new way of saying something and explaining something, or just to say, you know what? That's a question I've never thought of. Right. I got to right. exactly. think on that yes. for a little while. Exactly. And, and, exactly. And maybe we'll, yeah. And, 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 and to know that there are no absolute answers, no, no absolute truths, certainly in art and writing and, and more and more in life itself. So I, I, I but I get, I, when I get done, I've told you this before at the end of the day on Monday, after teaching two hours for uh, two classes uh, for six hours, I come home and I am, I, I'm empty. I, I'm drained like a, uh, like, like a wrung out dishcloth. I got nothing left. Yeah. And the next day, well, the next day I sit here and I talk to you by the time I'm done uh, with doing those two things, Monday and Tuesday, uh, the rest of my week, I am charged up because I've been doing things that are mentally stimulating. I feel good about them. Mm -hmm. It's yes. a happy moment. Yes. And then the rest of the week, I'm I'm like a rocket ship. And that's why I say it's the stimulation that might be key, because whether it's a, yeah. a bad thing like me doing my taxes, it, it still is creating new pathways. It's giving me new ways yeah. to think about things, new problems to solve or good things. Like I go to vacation with the family, you know, that's yeah. all, that's a couple of days of a whole new stimuli, both the good and the bad, the, the sad moments in my life and the good moments in my life. They're creating new stimuli, new pathways in my brain and new connections between disparate ideas that are the spark of creativity. So uh, if anything, I would say, uh, if you if you want to try to either spark creativity or to continue that loop, continue experiencing the world in, in the best ways that you can in your life. Hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. 
And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. Well, Brad, at the middle of the show, we've got some updates for everybody. Brad kindly looked up the dates for me, by the way. This show is going to be going live to the world on April 11th, which turns out is the last day of my Kickstarter <laughs> over at PicklesBook.com. So if you haven't checked it out, boy, PicklesBook.com, here's hoping, fingers crossed, I made it. Oh, boy. Oh. Uh, but again, I'm super proud of the book, so do check us out over at PicklesBook.com. Uh, that's a plural, PicklesBook.com. And Brad, uh, one update that I wanted to give to everybody because it was one of my predictions predictions for the beginning of 2023. So this would have been, what, 14 months ago, 15 months ago. Uh, I yeah. One of my predictions was that I thought that TikTok was going to be banned in the U.S. Um, and my reasoning at the time was based mainly on foreign ownership that, uh, yes, Facebook is terrible. Yes, uh, Google and Twitter can be terrible. Uh, but that the U.S. government wouldn't like that the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, ostensibly had access to those servers. And so for the same reason that they forced the sale of Grindr um, back in the day uh, to a, a domestic um, owner, that they would either force or close TikTok. And it looks like I, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but it looks like that's what the Senate uh, might follow on the House uh, and just recently passed a bill to do. So we'll see. I don't know. Brad, any thoughts about that before the in I didn't know that they forced. I didn't know that Grindr had uh, a non-U.S. Uh, uh, owner, and I didn't know that they forced them to sell it. Yeah. Uh, this and is the all reason, news to me. The reason being was. I guess I don't follow that app as close. Specifically uh, uh, for Grindr, they were very aware. <laughs> <laughs> they were, they were, I, was, I was waiting for that to land with you. But, but in all seriousness, in all seriousness, I didn't know that happened. Yeah. And they did it for the same reason that they're. They're, they're wanting to do it for uh, TikTok, which is they're worried about data being used to blackmail or yeah. to be uh, in some way used against either diplomats or military leaders or people in key situations for government or industry or culture. Um, because you can see when you have access to someone's likes and dislikes and all their their sort of proclivities that you could yeah. twist the knife in terms of blackmail. So I th I think for the same reason that they they forced the sale of Grinder that they will do it for TikTok. Although we'll see, there seems to be political will from it, but there also is a lot of money behind TikTok. So we'll see yeah. how that goes. Uh, but that was one of my predictions, if you remember, for 2023, and it looks like it's getting closer now in spring of 2024. It sure does. And just as long as we're in update mode, we mentioned at the top of the show, but we do have a special multi-part series coming up on Kickstarter. So you definitely want to be a Patreon backer so you can hear that because yep. by the time that I'm done and Dave's done, we're going to do a postmortem on both of our Kickstarters. And we, I can, I can just tell you right now, we're going to have an awful lot of stuff to talk about. Yeah. So with that being said, David, I've got a question that came in from one of our Patreon backers, Dino, who says, I'm curious you have, if you have any comic favorites from outside of the U.S., taking on that outside the U.S. theme from our previous update. Since countries like Italy, France, and Spain, to name a few, have fostered many great comics over the years, I imagine Brad, with his Not Safe for Work comic, would have found some favorites in that comic arena that seems to be more accepted in Europe than in the U.S. So, have you do, uh, do you have any favorites? Have you been thinking about doing conventions in Europe? Uh, and and uh, all kinds of uh, side topics like that many thanks for making such a great podcast kind regards dino so dave uh comics from outside of the u.s i first of all i think we can take the the last question first i i uh, other than when you went to angoulême <laughs> to promote <laughs> you did it! <laughs> Uncle you went there to promote Stripped, but aside from that, neither one of us has done comic conventions other than maybe if you count Canada, obviously. Uh, we haven't done a whole lot of conventioneering yeah. outside yeah. Of, Can of the United States. Yeah, I've, I've yet to do one in Mexico. I did uh, two or three in Canada, either Calgary or Toronto. But I, yeah. I'll be honest, I haven't done one in 
maybe 10 years in Canada just because the cost is so exorbitant. And kind of the same reason it, I, is why I wouldn't do one in Europe is the cost to travel yeah. and to get my books there, more importantly, is so expensive. Uh, the only reason why Fred Schroeder and I did the stripped trip to Angoulême was because <laughs> uh, the French paid for our flight and p- got us a hotel, uh, which are really hard to get around Angoulême. And so, you know, why wouldn't you go if they're going to pay the way? Um, right. Although there was zero money to be made when we were there. But um, don't get me wrong. I would love to do European Comic Cons. I would love it. Yeah. I would absolutely love it. Um, I would love to do Comic Cat in Japan. It's one of my big bucket list things in my life yeah. to at some point get to do Comic Cat, which I think someone could do the math on it, but I think it's two to three times the size of San Diego Comic Con. It's just bonkers huge. Um, yeah. But for the same reason, I don't know that I ever will, because for the most part, the French and the German and the Japanese, they don't care about my comics. I could no. barely I could barely get English speakers to care about my comics. <laughs> so uh, it's I, I don't know that I'll ever get invited again to an international show. Um, Strip was yeah. very specific uh, because it had a broader reach as a documentary. How about you, Brad? Can you ever see yourself doing a, a, a European? Or would you would you want to do it? First of all, I'd love to. I'd love, love, love to do Angoulême. I'd love to do Comic Cat. I'd like I'd, I'd love to do any of those, <laughs> frankly, you know, uh, but uh, same thing. I I, I don't I, I, I actually think that you and I have a better chance of getting invited to a place like that as Comic Lab than we do as creators of a specific comic. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, maybe. I could see them bringing, uh, like, the two of us out to talk comics, uh, but, like, to, uh, Brad, we want you to come out here and sell Evil Inc. I, I don't see that happening. And, again, because of the costs involved, I don't know that it would be worth my time to do it. If I went to, I I, I still have Angoulême as a bucket list I type love, of thing. I love when you say it with that Michigan, uh, the Angoulême, <laughs> Angoulême. It's my favorite thing. I want to go to Angoulême. It's great, Angoulême. It, but if I went, I would go as a as a as a person, not as a cartoonist. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to sell. I would go as an attendee. Wouldn't it be not, wouldn't it be fun just as friends to go? That'd be fun. If our wives let us, that'd be fun to go to Angela. Oh, hell yes. Uh, but also, uh, I too think oddly enough that comic lab might bring us to more places in the world than our comics in terms of the stuff. But I don't know that the French would want to hear what we have to say about owning and controlling your comics and the sort of like leaning into capitalism type approach that we advocate the few interactions that we've had on panels with French cartoonists, yeah. they're kind of like a gas that way. They they're, were, they're like, live in poverty, get one cigarette a day, and that's what you get. <laughs> and, but, but you are a true artist. Oh, <laughs> yes. You know, that kind of yeah, thing. So, it was, it was, I still remember that conversation. Uh, and it was at the NCS, wasn't yeah, it? Was it was at the National Cartoon Society, yeah. And uh, yeah, and yeah, I, yeah, maybe they're not interested. In, maybe, but you know, you never know. Maybe as a sideshow, maybe as, hey, look at these freaks. Yeah, they, yeah, that maybe. would be interesting. I feel like Boulet you know? gets it in terms of uh, in terms of owning and controlling your comics and and making yeah. a good living out of it. But I, there's a lot of French cartoonists that are like aghast at the idea of of pursuing money. Uh, yeah. As it, with comics, you know, it, but the, I'd, the, I'd go to London. I I know there's a comic convention in London. If I'd go to London listening from London, second. I would go. I, yeah, we'd we'd go and talk at a London convention. You know, Frank, listen, if you, if you give us an airfare and a free bowl of soup, we'll, we'll show up anywhere and do a show. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I love how to, we're such a cheap date, a bowl of soup. Yeah. Here's your bowl of soup. Uh, yeah, no, it's true. Um, OK, but as far as international comics. So. So, yes, yeah. we would love to go. It's really just a cost issue in the same reason why we know a lot of um, Aussie cartoonists that would love to come to the U.S., but yeah. it's just incredibly expensive to come from Sydney or, or uh, you know, the, that flight is bonkers. So, um uh, so yes, we would love to go. It's really just a cost issue. But as far as what we read internationally, yeah. uh, currently one of my favorite comics of recent years is uh, international. It's um, and I, I'm going to pronounce it wrong. It's either Free Ren or Fry Ren. Like no one seems to know the exact pronunciation that I've talked to, but it's yeah. it's spelled F R E I E R E N, I believe. Um, and it is uh, Japanese. It's uh, the author is Yamada, and it is a gorgeous story. Um, and sorry, the correct spelling is F R I E R E N and it's called free Ren, free Ren beyond journey's end. 
beautiful story. I think I talked about it briefly before. It sort of is what happens in the Lord of the Rings after Sauron is defeated and the party oh. somewhat goes their separate ways. And it's a fun that idea. so great. It's a fun yeah. idea. Um, and uh, so I highly recommend that one. Uh, uh, the illustrations are really fun. I, I enjoy Spy Family also from um, uh, yes. Uh, yes. House Husband, The Way of the House Husband's fun. Um, I'm trying to think of other uh, manga specific ones. Uh, do you read? Well, let me start with you. Do you, let's start with Japan. Do, what, what are you enjoying out of Japan? I, I, I really I, I know it's it's kind of past its its expiration date. Like it's it's not exactly new and it's not exactly uh, uh, cool. But I, every time I read My Hero Academia, I get reminded of how far you can push your creativity yeah, yes. in this very yes. old superhero trope kind of thing that I've been working uh, with for a long time and I keep getting reminded very gently by by that comic that that you could you could be pushing this further you could you could go you could it's okay to be weird in fact just um, I'm re, re rerunning them on TikTok right now but I had a chapter where it, it, I had one of the characters much, much more cartoony than everybody else. He's a little aardvark and he's right. like the uh, uh, he's the branch manager of the Akron, Ohio branch of Evil Incorporated. And and I, I just made him just a little cartoon instead of being like a humanoid or drawn realistically. And I I. That was a direct influence of My Hero Academia. I would have never been comfortable doing that before. But I'm like, no, you you can do it and your audience will accept it. And I just ran it on TikTok. The first thing people are remarking is that they love this little aardvark. You know? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, that's a good reminder there. You know, because sometimes we stay, we're, we're so concerned with staying in our lane and doing what we do that we forget that. Some of the joy of cartooning is is swerving outside of your lane for right. a little bit. And right, being right, right. You know, being creative. So so I, I always point to that one in in terms of Japanese comics. Uh, are we are we just doing Japanese or are we going to do all over the place? No, no, no. I thought we would go around the world because I, I just want to uh, jump off what you said. I also like yeah. uh, My Hero Academia. I also love how sort of the, the wildness of the creativity. Um, I will say in general, um, uh, when I read um, My Hero Academia, I can feel that it's written for uh, sort of 10 to 15 year olds. And that's fine, by the way. But I'm just saying I would have absolutely loved it if I was that age. The yeah. same, and I feel the same way about One Piece. It's also just bonkers creative. It's yes. kind of it's just it's for younger kids. It's not it's not you know what I mean? Like it's perfectly fine. Yeah. But I'm more struck by just how bonkers creative it is. That mix of old world, new world, high technology, low technology, a little bit of magic, but also real world. And it's like it's yeah. it's just very bonkers creative. So I kind of put One Piece in the same way that I put uh, My Hero Academia is that it's just creativity taken to the nth level it's 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 fun it's fun to see mm -hmm. and yeah. i also another one for me and then i'll pass it back to you sorry about this uh, i really enjoyed just the, the the fundamental core idea of attack on titan i thought that was a really fun manga i thought that was uh i didn't per se love the art style but it did work for the story that it was trying to sell but yeah. the, basically the basic core idea i thought was really fun yeah, absolutely. Another one. Uh, this is an old school. This goes way back. Uh, it, it's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, I think Belgian comic. Uh, it's called Asterix or Asterix with an X. With an X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and by uh, I, and I will mispronounce. This is going to be fun. Here we go. Names, Here we go. Go, uh, go skinny and Uderzo. <laughs> <laughs> I know I that I did that By the way, wrong. I'm not correcting you because I have no idea no, how to pronounce it. I know, but I, I and uh, I, uh, I'm trying to, I, I've got their Wikipedia page up right now because I want, okay, Franco-Belgian. It first appeared in the Franco-Belgian comic magazine. And uh, I've got a couple of collections that I picked up at like used bookstores and stuff like sure, that. Sure, sure, sure. And I just it I it just resurfaced as I was uh, uh, redoing the office over here, and I put it on my nightstand and started reading it uh, again, rereading it. 
in such joyful, silly, wonderful uh, 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 comics, really, really great for what it is. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've just been really enjoying rereading Asterix uh, lately. It's, it's, the art is, is gorgeous. And I, I look at these pages, large format pages. It's got four rows of, of comics, if you will, right? In other words, I see so much uh, influence from Asterix into Evil Inc. Because oh. I do the same thing. I've got, I, I, in other words, you know how I, 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 I split up my page between uh, uh, Tuesday is the top half of the page, Thursday's the bottom half of the page. Right. I take those two halves and that's a page. Well, it's, it's four rows, just like Asterix. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, there's a lot of layout influence here. In other words, you don't see them doing uh, a diagonal gutters and polygon panels and one huge. It, it was a lot of kind of what I do. I do it for a different reason. I do it so I can easily uh, split those up so I can put them into a scroll online. Right. But so much visual uh, influence in terms of layout. Uh, it com- came directly from those Asterix books that I read years and years ago. Uh, yeah, I, I I will be honest. I I tried Asterix. Didn't wasn't for me, but I I get it. I get it. Did you did you ever get into Tonton? No, Tonton. never. I did. I that I, I I really did not. That that didn't hit with me. Yeah, Tintin never really registered with me too. I always appreciated the art, but it never really uh, locked on with me. I did, I I got, uh, because I have a little free library out in front of my house for folks that know what that is. And at one time, someone brought in a whole collection of original Babar comics. Remember Babar, yeah. the, the, elephant? the elephant? And I brought it into my house thinking, oh, the kids will love Babar. I, I, yeah, Babar is an elephant, how cute. And I think Babar was French, maybe Belgian, I don't remember. Anyway. Uh, super racist. And I was like, whoa, we're getting these books out of this house. I was like, oh God, (laughs) no, I'm not, we're not reading Babar. So did not hold up and I do not recommend it. Um, did you ever read Der Strumpfs, Brad? Der Strumpfs or Les Strumpfs Strumpf, or whatever oh, they're called? Oh, this, uh, the, the, the original version of the Smurfs? The Smurfs? No, no, I was not, that was not for me either. But I will tell you what I, what, what I read recently, uh, that I absolutely adore. It's, uh, Mirka Andolfo. Uh, it has a, a comic series called Unsacred. Unsacred, so oh, okay. Art, and so this is an uh, an Italian uh, artist, Mirka and Dolfo. And Unsacred is the art is is so good it just makes you want to put your pencil down and and be an accountant for the rest of your life. <laughs> the art is so good, and it's about a and and by the way, also very much not safe for work. Well, not very much. It's it. I would call it soft core, the yeah, nudity and stuff. Not, okay. not anything yeah. past that. Yeah. But, uh, gorgeous. And it's about a devil who falls in love with an angel. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, and, that's, a, and that's a courting that's her. Well. Yeah. And she doesn't want to do anything before marriage. And of course he's a devil. So he's, you know, he's very much uh, struggling with this, but he's so in love with her that he's also, it's also very sweet. He's like, no, no, I'm going to try. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And, uh, so it's 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 gorgeous. It's beautifully drawn. There's a lot of difference in sexual attitudes between the United States and Italy. <laughs> Clearly, there's some stuff that like I couldn't have even imagined uh, uh, jokes pulling off. Uh, but it's it really is uh, a wonderful, wonderful series uh, that is translated from the original Italian into English. Sometimes well, sometimes not so well. But man, the art is worth it. Well, let me, this is fun. Let me ask you some more. Did you ever read uh, other French comics? Did you ever read uh, Lucky Luke or Spirou or? Uh, uh, Not only I'm going to I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show my ignorance in all of its glory. Not only never read them, never heard of them. Okay. How about heavy metal? Did you ever read the 70s sort of like? Uh, now uh, we're talking. <laughs> 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 those I heard of. <laughs> those I'm familiar with. Yes. So, so going back to an old story that I shared on Drunk Comic Lab years back, my introduction to comics was Uncle Edju, who drove truck uh, and, and drove delivered. Truck. Oh that was God. a delivery driver. And one of the things that he 
uh, drove uh, was magazine deliveries to the drugstore and comics. And of course, in those days, if the comic didn't sell, they'd rip the cover off it and they'd throw it back to get pulped. So, and same thing with magazines. And so he had this whole big box full of comics that had the covers ripped off them that he'd saved for me and my brother and brought them over one day. This, and this was my introduction. This is the day I fell in love with comics. Brought them over and plopped them down. And my brother and I hustled them back into our bedroom and we started dividing them up. I took all the Marvels for some reason. He took all the DCs and we're going through, we're going through. Well, all of a sudden, my mom comes running in, grabs the box, takes it, and then uh, she's gone. I hear commotion in the kitchen, and then she comes back and plops it down, and with a huff, she leaves. And the 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 the, 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 the there was just a few lit. The comics were sitting lower in the box. There was clearly something had been taken out. Well, it turns out he threw some Playboys in the bottom for us oh, boys. <laughs> so if we would have been, if we would have gotten through that different, I would have, I would have had a completely different love affair with media. But, <laughs> but there were some comics that had been left at the bottom that she just dismissed as comics. Those were heavy metal magazines. So I had got a couple of those in there as well, and that kind of started my uh, uh, fascination with heavy metal and the and the and the really next level sci fi heavy metal always kind of is like, oh, yeah, they had nudity. But the sci fi writing in heavy metal was also really next level kind of stuff. Yeah. Like um, uh, Mobius did some heavy metal, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I will be honest. I, and, and this is an unnecessary for critique, but who cares? I always found that the art in heavy metal and in Mobius, amazing, wonderful, yeah. stunning. The storytelling. Ah, <laughs> it was I, there were some there were some good stories. I, I got ah. captivated by some of the storytelling. Yeah, okay, you know what? Let me ask you, Brad. What's that one yeah. Mobius story that sticks with you? Oh, the plot was so fun. What's that one, Brad? What's, oh, what's the, the Mobius story where, that really uh, stays uh, in your uh, craw? Uh, <laughs> okay, I got nothing. <laughs> I got but nothing. no critique. Uh, undeniably, the be- one of the best artists that's ever lived, in, uh, especially yes. um, uh, in comics. Uh, Mobius was amazing. Yeah. Uh, Jean, Jean Girard, if I remember correctly. Uh, but not, I mean, uh, the stories were okay. The stories were okay. And that's how I kind of met, uh, felt about heavy metal. There were a few that stood out that were great um oh you know what oh god i'm just remembering i'm jumping back into the i don't normally like horror comics and i'm blanking on his name who's the guy that did that's that's the whole that's the one for me and he also did uh spiral uh what's his name oh darn it i'm forgetting it but anyway People that know horror comics will know him. I love his work. His, he's great. And I take it he's from outside of the United States. Yeah, he's a Japanese cartoonist, and I'm totally blanking on his name. This is embarrassing. But if I say the story, that's I know it sounds weird. That's my whole. That's the one for me. People will know yeah. that story that know horror comics. It's a terrifying okay, story. I'm not, I'm not pulling anything. But Junji I, Ito. Sorry, I just searched for it. <laughs> Junji Ito. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's it's um, an amazing story. Uh, I think it was yeah. the, the story was called. I think it was called. It was made for me. Um, it's yeah. a great horror story. Oh, it was so good. Just Google the phrase. It was made for me, Junji okay. Ito, and then read that story online. It is inarguably one of the best sci-fi horror stories you will ever read in your life. It only takes wow. about half an hour. It's amazing. It's an amazing story. Uh, uh, okay, now I got to check it out. But one one thing I wanted to I I, I kind of wanted to talk about and and I don't know where this where this leads me but I was starting to kind of check out not safe for work comics so I would go at comic conventions to where some of these uh, comics were being sold and I started picking up some uh, it, so I want so I could get a better feel for you know the industry or the or the genre that I was trying to get into. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these were European comics that were not safe for work. And I got to tell you, for the most part, I really did not like them. I really did, didn't. I, I I kind of recoiled for them, uh, not 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 for any other reason than the fact that the the characters being drawn there did not look like they were enjoying what was going on. They didn't look like they <laughs> were, they were, they, they didn't look like, like they were enjoying the sex. There's with, with it, particularly Italian comics and, and some comics that I picked up from, from Mexico. They, there's a lot of grimacing. There's a lot of, uh, you know, like, like, you know, sexual, uh, uh, almost a- anger, anger, you know, almost anger, yeah. angry eyes and downturned faces. And a lot of, I mean, you know, 
exertion. <laughs> All right. Sure. But nobody seemed to be really happy with <laughs> and I and and that made me as a reader really uncomfortable. And I'm like, these people don't seem to be having a good time. And that and that was actually really useful to me when I started doing my own because I, I, I wanted my characters. I, I wanted nobody to have any question that my characters wanted to be doing this activity that they were doing. Right. I never wanted right. there to be a, a doubt that this was a happy moment, that this was happy, consensual, uh, uh, fun time. Right, right, right. Um, well, okay, uh, I will, I'm taking us around the world, continuing any, uh, I'll, I'll be honest, and there are great, there is great work from Australia like uh, Black Stump and Beyond the, Beyond the, I forget what the other one's called. Uh, all those sort of, uh, I never really got into Australian comics. You or Kiwi cartoonists, I, I never really. I, you know what? Although what? Love Is, what a hit for me, Love oh, Is as a young love kid. Love Is, <laughs> definitely, I've got, I've got him framed right over there. And after meeting Jason Chatfield, I kind of did a little bit of a quick deep dive into Ginger Megs yeah. or I went, that, that he was writing. I, he did some good stuff. Yeah. Uh, By the way, Ginger, Ginger Meg ran for, has been running. Sorry, not ran. Uh, what, like eighty years, ninety years, something like that. Yeah. It's, it's been bonkers yeah. long. So yeah. But like, I, I, I never real. I kind when when I I dismiss legacy strips a lot, and I'm like, nah, okay. So he's he's doing a legacy strip. I, 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 what what's what's the most he could be doing with it? He was he not for nothing. I don't think anybody ever talks about. He was doing some really great Calvin and Hobbes kind of sh stuff with Ginger Megs. It yeah, would, yeah, yeah. Uh, we know that he's a really good gag writer, very good artist. Uh, I was I, I I found it kind of jaw dropping when I actually looked into what he was doing with that strip. I, I realized I'd been sleeping on it for an awful long time. Uh, and then, uh, okay, so continuing around the world, uh, Latin America, anyone for you that stand out? Uh, in, Latin in America, I, I'd have to say, oh, you already mentioned, what's the proper pronunciation? Uh, Mafalda. Mafalda, the Argentinian comic strip, yeah. Yeah, Mafalda, yeah, uh, yeah, very, very good stuff. Yeah, I... Uh, I like the sweetness, but also the sort of the political twinge of Mafalda. I thought that was yes. that was a, that was well done. That was some, that was a mix of um, of uh, good. And I will say, even though I grew up in San Diego and have a passing uh, readability in Spanish, I, Mexican comics never sparked. With, they kind of, for the most part, never made their way north. Um, yeah. but, uh, no real spark. I will say there's a Canadian title that I always loved. It's a very small little title called Alpha Flight. Loved Alpha <laughs> <laughs> Canadian. <laughs> that was John Byrne working for Marvel I, I will Comics. say though, John Byrne's run on, on the Canadian uh, super oh, group of Alpha Flight was so one of my good. favorites. It's so fun. So good. It's Especially so those first few issues. The first like 20 really, really issues. Of, like it falls off the rails a hundred percent after that. Yeah. But the first 20 but issues or so of Alpha Flight are so fun. Don't forget, he was doing that at the same time he was doing Fantastic Four. Yeah. I mean, there there was that uh, talking about peop, uh, people that were, um, you know, maximizing their creativity and stuff. Uh, that was an amazing period of time for that one particular creator. Yeah, that period also has one of the most famous comic books of all time. Where <laughs> I knew the we were going to talk about The it. character Snowbird in Alpha Flight fights in a snowstorm blizzard against one of the great white, uh, uh, the great, I'm uh, sorry, the great beasts of the northern white. White uh, territories of Canada, and the yeah. whole comic strip is, or the whole comic book is white because uh, they were trying to crank it out while he. I think he was doing Fantastic Four, and I think he was also guesting on Wolverine at something or something on that point, or maybe on X Men. Yeah, he might have been. And so he was just way overworked. He's like, you know what? The whole comic book is white. It's all going to be yep. white. They're fighting in a snowstorm. It's all just word balloons. Just, just sound effects. Yeah, just sound, sound effects, effects and word balloons. balloons. It's great. Yeah. Uh, and so that one's fun. Oh, another, another little uh, Canadian character you might like, Brad, perhaps. Wolverine, have you? Are you familiar? Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, Canadian. Uh, Wolverine is Canadian, and I think with that we we're kind of <laughs> tipping our hand that we've run out of outside of the United States yeah, comics exactly. to talk we're not, about. We've now scraped the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know what? The good thing about scraping the bottom of the barrel is that there's always going to be a new barrel next week, and we're going to be the ones bringing it to you when you hear us say that you've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been my wonderful friend, Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Link at evilcomic.com. And my friend, 
Dave Kellett, the co-director of the comics documentary Stripped and the cartoonists of Sheldon at SheldonComics.com and Drive at DriveComic.com. And I'll say it so he doesn't have to. Today is the last day you can get those great rewards he's go- got going on over at NewPickleBook.com. Nope, not, not right. at all, not close. Picklesbook.com. New pickles, pickles, what is it? Pick, picklesbook.com, just picklesbook.com. Picklesbook.com. Picklesbook. Yes, Picklesbook. 19th time is a charm on that one. That was good. Picklesbook.com. And I'm going to say the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And what was funny about that was, all right, and I'll be, I'll be the one to say it so that he doesn't say it. It's it's new Sheldon book by Dave Kellett.com. New shut. Nope, nope, that's not it. I'll be the one to say it so that he doesn't have to say it. <laughs> well, I was trying to be nice. I, I, I didn't want to put you in the position of having to promote no, your own God, stuff. Bless your heart. So I, you I figured good. I could say I could say Pickles Book as well as you could. <laughs> but it turns out I couldn't. No, Picklesbook.com. You're a good egg to say Picklesbook.com. This episode was edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. If you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify, and you may hear your review featured on a future episode. And Comic Lab is made possible by your support on Patreon.com slash Comic Lab. So we will go ahead and say that twice. Patreon.com slash Picklesbook.com. Well, I will say this to our friends outside of the United States. If you want Brad and I to come to a show, reach out to the yeah. show. They, oh, may, gosh, yes. they may listen to suggestions about guests they should bring out, and you can tell them that they will get the two-for-one. of uh, They'll get Evil Inc., they'll get Sheldon and Drive, and they'll get Comic Lab as well. Like, we, we represent a good value to a comics con. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And, and, and we'll show up early. We'll set up the chairs. I'll sweep. I'll do what needs to be done. Dave sweeps very, very well. Yeah. And we'll, you know, we'll, 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 we'll greet guests out front <laughs> you know if there's there's anybody that needs to be uh, uh guided around sure. uh, the, the show floor we'll do a, a a show guided tour we'll do listen we'll do what it takes just get us out of the house <laughs> <laughs>